Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SRNA Ask the Expert podcast series. Today's podcast is entitled Fatigue and Rare Neuroimmune Disorders. My name is Gigi DeFibri, and I will be moderating this podcast along with Julia Lefelar. Yes, hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say that my name is Julia Leffler, and I am a co-founder of the MOG Project at the SRNA. The MOG Project was founded by myself, my daughter, Christina Leffler, Amy Edney, and Cynthia Albright. The MOG Project is devoted to raising awareness, advancing research, and providing support and advocacy for our community in hopes of finding a cure. I was diagnosed with MOG antibody disease in 2017, but my journey started 19 years ago with a mild vision darkening and a two-year bout of debilitating chronic fatigue that thankfully has since resolved. This is what motivated me to explore fatigue and rare neuroimmune disorders. I'd like to thank the SRNA, the doctors, and our MOG project members, Peter Fontanez and Andrea Mitchell, for their contributions to this podcast. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just, just to start, uh, the Seagull Rare Neuroimmune Association is a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune disorders. You can learn more about us on our website at wearesrna.org. So this podcast is being recorded and will be made available on our website and for download via iTunes. During the call, if you have any additional questions, you can send a message through the chat option that's available through GoToWebinar. We also want to thank the sponsors of this month's podcast, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Viela Bio, and Genentech. Alexion is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on serving patients with severe and rare disorders through the innovation, development, and commercialization of life-transforming therapeutic products. Their goal is to deliver, is to deliver medical breakthroughs where none currently exist, and they are committed to ensuring that patient perspective and community engagement is always at the forefront of their work. Viela Bio is dedicated to the development and commercialization of novel life-changing medicines for patients with a wide range of autoimmune and severe inflammatory diseases. Their team is comprised of passionate, talented, world-class leaders with diverse experience in the autoimmune disease space, and their research focuses on well-established critical biological pathways shared across multiple indications. And then also, um, founded more than 40 years ago, Genentech is a leading biotechnology company that discovers, develops, manufactures, and commercializes medicines to treat patients with serious and life-threatening medical conditions. The company, a member of the Roche Group, has headquarters in South San Francisco, California. For additional information about the company, please visit gene.com. For today's podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Carlos Pardo and Dr. Bardia Norbakash. Dr. Pardo is a professor of neurology and neuropathology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. He is the principal investigator of the Neuroimmunopathology Laboratory, member of the HIV Neurosciences Research Group, and clinical neurologist at the Multiple Sclerosis and Transverse Myelitis Centers at Johns Hopkins Hospital. His clinical specialization is on neuroimmunological and infectious disorders of the nervous system, with particular focus on multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, neurosarcoidosis, and neurological complications of autoimmune disorders. Thank you. And Dr. Norbach is an assistant professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's board certified in neurology by the American Board of Psych Psychiatry and Neurology. He's an expertise in multiple sclerosis and neuroimmunology. He earned his medical degree from Tehran University School of Medical Sciences and completed a residency in neurology at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He studied epidemiology, study design, and biostatistics, obtaining a Master's of Advanced Studies degree in clinical research from the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, where he also completed a fellowship in MS and neuroimmunology. His research training focused on the design and execution of clinical tri trials and use of biomarkers in MS. His current research interests include the comparative effectiveness studies of symptomatic and disease-modifying therapies in MS, as well as identifying new pathophysiologic mechanisms and therapeutic targets for MS-related fatigue. He's the principal investigator of a two-center randomized double-blind crossover clinical trial funded by the Patient Center's Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, which focuses on commonly used fatigue medications for MS. Welcome, and thank you both so much for joining us today. 
Thank so, you, Gigi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so to start, um, just to, to you know, get a kind of general overview about the potential causes of fatigue in these conditions. You know, what what are the main causes of fatigue in neuroimmune conditions specifically? Should I go That's first? It. Sure. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Sure. So first of all, before uh, talking about causes of fatigue, I want to define what we are talking about, what we call fatigue uh, in neurological or neuroimmune disorder. So uh, there are many different uh, perceptions of what fatigue is, but uh, mostly today we are going to talk about fatigue as defined by subjective lack of physical or mental energy that is perceived by the patient or caregiver uh, to the degree that interferes with the usual and desired activities. So it's important to uh, acknowledge that this is a subjective feeling and it's really, really difficult to measure it by objective measures that we have for other conditions uh, in medicine. So um, uh, when we define fatigue by that, uh, it's good to also categorize fatigue, uh, again, in neuroimmune conditions and uh, neurology. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, categorize fatigue as primary fatigue, which means that it's part of the disease. It's uh, one of the essential components of the disease. For example, uh, in MS, fatigue is truly one of the main symptoms of of, of the disease. Uh, there is secondary fatigue that is caused by uh, other issues that is seen in neuroimmune disorders. For example, many uh, patients who have uh, neuroimmune disorders, they suffer from bladder dysfunction that keeps, uh, keeps them up at night, or they suffer from uh, spasms, leg spasms that uh, wakes them up at night. And uh, these conditions basically uh, causes fatigue. Um, there is probably another um, cause of fatigue that may not be directly related to these diseases. For example, many patients who have uh, neuroimmune disorders may have uh, thyroid problems, hypothyroidism, or anemia. They are comorbid conditions that uh, can cause fatigue. So as you see, we deal with a pretty complex situation here. Thank you very much for that. Um, you know, just to follow up, how do medical professionals determine what that underlying cause of fatigue that a patient experiences? Dr. Norbach? Sure. Uh, so again, like anything else in medicine, uh, getting a good history and physical examination is uh, the first step. Um, just um, Acknowledging fatigue, asking a uh, patient if they have this um, overwhelming feeling of uh, lack of mental and physical energy, that would be the first step. Uh, the next step would be asking about other condition, comorbid condition, uh, that can cause fatigue. Again, uh, inquiring about patient's sleep, inquiring about other medical conditions like uh, anemia and thyroid problem, that the patient may be aware of, or they can be checked by a very uh, easy blood work. So that would be the first step. Um, and if we inquire about them, if they are they don't seem to be a problem, then I assume that this is the primary fatigue that is the, that is really a part of the uh, neurological condition that the patient has. Great, thank you so much uh, for that you know introduction and explanation. Um, so then, in terms of, is there any sort of relationship between, you know, the amount of time someone has had a, one of these conditions or their age um, and, you know, how this might affect fatigue frequency or severity? Uh, Dr. Pardo? So, thank you, Gigi, for that question. So, I, it's extremely important to characterize a, a couple of uh, concepts uh, that, uh, uh, Dr. Bardia uh, uh, outlined in the past uh, few minutes. And uh, there are two major categories of uh, 
of uh, fatigue. And uh, uh, one is what is described as a mental fatigue, and the other one is described as uh, physical fatigue. Um, you are asking about the age factor, and you are asking about duration of a disorder, for example. And, and these are uh, important factors as well that influence uh, uh, the presence of fatigue. It, it, it appears that the age, and it appears that uh, the, uh, uh, the characteristic of the disease are not necessarily uh, major players in uh, defining uh, mental fatigue or physical fatigue. What is important is the magnitude of the neuroimmunological problem and also the magnitude of the uh, neurological impact of that uh, neuroimmunological problem on the body of the patient. Let me give you an example. So in terms of uh, mental fatigue, uh, one thing is extremely important to understand is uh, mental fatigue is that type of situation in which uh, patients feel uh, exhausted, uh, patients feel that unable to think very well and unable to concentrate and unable to focus uh, 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 mentally. And many of those uh, uh, elements of fatigue may be related uh, not necessarily with age, but may be related with uh, the magnitude and extension of the neuroimmunological problem. Let me give you an example. So patients with multiple sclerosis that have a heavy burden of uh, disease in the brain or cerebral cortex, those patients may have a higher risk to have more problems in uh, 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 mental connectivity, meaning that the uh, uh, brain networks that are needed to maintain uh, a good and active and, uh, and efficient uh, mental level are going to be somewhat affected by the disorder. A different situation may happen in a patient with myelitis. And a different situation may happen in patients that have a spinal cord disorder, in which, for example, the major burden of the disease is uh, in the neuromuscular system because patients with myelitis, for example, have a higher uh, burden of uh, mechanical activity because the difficulties with mobility, that actually is going to influence mostly the physical fatigue. And that physical fatigue is going to be uh, determined not only by the status of uh, neuromuscular function mobility, but uh, the amount of uh, energy consumption that a patient may need for uh, producing effective and efficient movement. So fatigue is, is really a complex equation, and, and that is one of the important elements in which the clinicians that is dealing with uh, all of these disorders need to analyze not only the neuroimmunological problem, but also other elements in the equation, including the age of the patient, including the type of work, including the type of activity, and including other uh, uh, secondary factors, for example, the energy consumption, the diet, weight, and even the sleep uh, patterns that those patients may be experiencing. So that is basically a very complex situation, and I, I, I try to outline at least some of the elements of that equation. Thank you, Dr. Pardo. Um, I, I want to continue and ask you another question about um, patients who have relapsing disease. Um, can the fatigue on its own be an indicator of some kind of relapse or a pseudo relapse or even worsening of symptoms for those people? Unfortunately, fatigue is not necessarily a good indicator. And, and let me explain why. Uh, fatigue, as I mentioned before, is influenced, influenced by too many different factors. And uh, when there are too many different factors influencing the presence of a symptom, like a mental fatigue or physical fatigue, it's very difficult to determine if fatigue is going to be used as an indicator of relapse. Uh, however, it's very clear that in many neuroimmunological disorders, when there is a, 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 a evidence or there is a activation of neuroinflammatory problems either in the brain or in the spinal cord, 
that is going to determine other uh, problems, particularly neurological uh, 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 difficulties that the patient are going to experience. And obviously, that, uh, those difficulties are going to magnify symptoms like fatigue. However, to be very simplistic, I think that fatigue is a symptom that uh, uh, reflects the status of, uh, uh, of a mental uh, and, and a physical neuromuscular function, but not necessarily reflects the activity of a disease. Uh, many patients that have, for example, a stable uh, 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 immunological activity associated with uh, mock related disorders, so NMO, or even uh, multiple sclerosis, some of those patients actually may experience uh, regular fatigue, and that fatigue may be influenced by other factors like sleep deprivation or diet. So uh, again, just to be simplistic, uh, 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 the fatigue as a symptom, unfortunately, unfortunately is, is not necessarily uh, an indicator of uh, uh, disease exacerbation. Great, thank you. Um, and then, so before we get into the, you know, the different types of fatigue, um, I know at the beginning, um, Dr. Norbox, you talked about how um, you know, fatigue can be caused by these various things like not sleeping at night or spasticity. Um, but how, how can someone know whether their fatigue is caused by the disease itself or, you know, for example, some type of depression or um, something like that, or, or physicians able to tell the difference between those two causes? Um, so uh, you pointed to a, a very common issue uh, in our clinic. It's, uh, as Dr. Pardo also mentioned, fatigue is a very multifactorial uh, issue in these diseases. So it would be extremely difficult to find or pinpoint to a single cause uh, for fatigue. Um, so it's difficult to disentangle someone who has sleeping problem and spasticity and bladder problem and thyroid issues if they are the only causes of fatigue or truly the disease, the underlying disease, is contributing. Uh, so in this situation, we try to, to treat all those uh, comorbid conditions. So if someone has uh, uh, bladder issues, waking uh, her up at night several times, uh, we try to work with uh, urology colleagues to alleviate that. If someone has a spasticity or painful spasms at night, uh, waking the patient up, we try to alleviate that. If uh, someone has, for example, uh, thyroid issues, of course, we try to work with the primary care doctor to, uh, to treat that. Uh, sometimes we see with treatment of these uh, comorbid conditions, the fatigue improves or goes away. So in, that, uh, in those moments, you can assume that they were the cause of the fatigue. But in many patients, despite treatment of those uh, comorbid issues, still the patient complains from uh, some residual fatigue. And at that point, you can assume that's the, the underlying um, neurological damage and network uh, damage in the brain or spinal cord is contributing to that. So basically, we try to treat the treatable parts. And if there is any uh, residual fatigue, we assume that's uh, related to the, uh, to the underlying disease, neuroimmune disease. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask and, and move on to talk about the types of fatigue. Um, so, you know, we sort of touched on this, but um, can pain really play a role in chronic fatigue in these diseases? So that's uh, 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 an interesting question. So uh, uh, going to the initial part of your question is define fatigue and and, and, and the classification of fatigue. Uh, so pain is, is a factor. Pain is another symptom that is determined by uh, a problem in either the spinal cord, the nerves, or peripheral organs that are obviously providing uh, a stress signal to the brain, and the brain is uh, activated to generate the pain signal. So that means that uh, pain is, is, is very likely a comorbidity in terms of uh, the equation of fatigue. Uh, and pain is 
uh, uh, frequently uh, symptom that is associated with fatigue and pain is a symptom that is very frequent in any type of neurological, neuromuscular uh, 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 abnormality. Uh, the elements that define pain in terms of the uh, anatomical uh, uh, presence of uh, pain is, is, is in many ways similar to the target that many neuroimmunological disorders uh, 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 are affecting. For example, uh, the pain depends on the structures in the brain that we call central structures. The pain depends on the spinal cord. Pain depends on the nerves, the sensory nerves that are associated with conduction of information between uh, uh, the periphery and the brain. And pain depends on uh, receptors that are the sensors of the uh, peripheral nervous system in different organs or in different areas of the body, including the skin. So when there is pain, pain is going to activate structures in the brain that eventually may enhance that perception of fatigue. So fatigue, as we mentioned before, depends of <clears throat> many factors, including central factors and peripheral factors. Um, uh, I will say that pain is probably a, a major factor that enhance and magnify many uh, uh, of the elements of fatigue, particularly the perception of uh, fatigue. And pain is going to influence other factors. For example, pain frequently uh, increases depression. Pain frequently increases sleep disorders. Pain in, uh, reduces physical activity. So. Uh, that eventually is going to influence uh, fatigue. So I want to stop here because I, I think that um, uh, um, we should focus on uh, other elements uh, of fatigue and neuroimmunological disorders. And I hope that I answered your, your question. So at least I, I explained in, 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 in a very simplistic way the interaction of fatigue and pain. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so then, you know, there there are, you know, a variety of, rare, you know, these rare neuroimmune disorders that, you know, that SRN works with. And, you know, different folks maybe have different experiences with the way they, you know, deal with fatigue or how it affects them. Um, do individuals with the different disorders kind of under this umbrella experience different types of fatigue, uh, Dr. Pardo? So uh, the answer is, is, is probably no. And let me go back to what was defined by Dr. Bardia and I defined previously. It's what is fatigue? So fatigue basically fits in two major categories. Uh, fatigue is the perception of fatigue or fatigue is associated with performance uh, or, or an activity. And fatigue actually may be defined as a central fatigue and peripheral fatigue. And when we have performance fatigue, that is basically the perception of tiredness, the perception of being uh, 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 exhausted, is, is that, that type of fatigue actually is associated with two uh, uh, major components, either central fatigue or central component. And, and that is when the neuroimmunological disorder will define what is the magnitude of the involvement? Let me give you an example. Central fatigue depends on all of the networks in the brain or spinal cord that are affected. So here we have disorders like neuromyelitis optica, in which most of the damage may be in the spinal cord networks. So we have here uh, MOC associated disorders in which the networks that are being disrupted are predominant in the spinal cord, but occasionally some patients also have other brain structures affected or even optic nerve affected. Or here we have problems like multiple sclerosis that have multi location uh, damage in, in, in the central nervous system networks. So those are uh, central uh, uh, type of uh, factors that determine a variability in the amount of fatigue. So the question is, is there any specific fatigue for any specific disorder? The answer is no. However, any, all of those specific disorders are, will, are going to define the magnitude and the distribution of uh, fatigue and particularly are affecting 
what we call the performance because it's going to affect the neuromuscular function, the amount of um, uh, motor weakness or muscle weakness or the amount of energy depletion that a patient is going to experience, or the amount of mechanical disturbance that a patient may experience with uh, different neuroimmunological disorders. So that actually is, is a very important uh, uh, example that yes, in terms of defining fatigue, there is no fatigue in MS, there is no specific fatigue in NMO, there is no specific fatigue in MOG. However, the magnitude of the overall neuroimmunological problem will define then what is, the, uh, is going to be uh, the major outcome in fatigue and the type of uh, variability in the fatigue that a patient may experience. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pardo. Um, I, I want to ask a question about um, patients who do not have the relapsing remitting disorder that still feel this intermittent fatigue. Um, why is that? Why is that? First of all, and and uh, for kids and and other people, how how can we help schools and work work situations uh, understand how to interact with those individuals that where their needs vary over time? Uh, Dr. Norbach. Sure. Um, so this is, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, something that depends on uh, just accepting and realizing that fatigue, although it's an invisible symptom, is a major problem and is a very common problem in patients with neuroimmune disease, diseases. Uh, for example, again, most of the research has been done in multiple sclerosis. Uh, different studies have reported between 50 to 90 percent of patients with MS have uh, fatigue, which makes it the most common symptom of MS. And as Dr. Pardo noted, even those patients who have uh, stable uh, disease do, are not experiencing relapses or progression of the disease, they still complain from uh, this severe and disabling fatigue. So not only um, fatigue is very common in these neuroimmune disorders, it's actually disabling. So there has been uh, studies showing that uh, fatigue could be as disabling as a walking problem. You know, walking uh, problem is probably the most dreaded uh, complication of many neuroimmune disorders, including MS, NMO, MOG. Uh, but fatigue actually uh, was uh, at the same place. Uh, uh, it was rated as the same place as walking problem uh, as a disabling uh, issue in these neuroimmune disorders. So just this problem being acknowledged by, by uh, treating neurologists and physicians and being conveyed to, to the employers and uh, families and significant others that true that this is not a problem that you can see, but this is as real and uh, as disabling as uh, things that are visible like walking problem. So, um, Again, uh, I think it's a matter of uh, making people uh, familiar with this issue and uh, accepting and realizing that uh, the importance of fatigue. Thank you. Yep, I think that's you know very important, especially since it's not you know as visibly obvious as you know some of these other symptoms might be. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked in the beginning. You did talk a little bit about how you know fatigue sometimes might go away over time for some folks. Um, you know, is, is fatigue, you know, both cognitive and kind of physically related fatigue um, in these conditions, is it, is it expected to ever go away or how does that kind of course change over time? Dr. Nor uh, Norbach? Uh, sure. Uh, at least based on my experience, I see fatigue mostly as a chronic problem. Although it fluctuates, you know, during the day, for example, most patients uh, feel better early in the morning and feel more tired uh, in the afternoon at night. Uh, or, for example, during the uh, summertime, uh, many patients uh, report more severe fatigue. But I have rarely seen fatigue, uh, someone who has fatigue, uh, after a year or two, be completely free of fatigue. Uh, so there are fluctuations, but in the big picture, I don't think fatigue usually uh, would be a symptom that completely goes away. Um, 
at least in my experience, and mostly what I'm talking uh, in patients with multiple sclerosis, at least that's the case. Thank you, that's uh, very insightful. And I, I wanna follow up on this, uh, the comment you made, because um, I, I certainly experienced um, what I'm about to describe in this next question. And I know a lot of other individuals with both MOG and ADEM experience this, but, um, you know, they don't suffer from any physical challenges, you know, other than maybe eye damage and things like that. Um, you don't have depression or insomnia that yeah, in the past they've got, undergone these acute attacks and they reported a very, very specific type, type of fatigue that can only be described as a light switch turning off. After resting for an hour or so, um, they're back to normal, only to repeat this after a few hours. Um, is fatigue in the absence of any, uh, you know, significant uh, visible damage to the central nervous system uh, recognized by neurologists as a sign of the disease? Um, and if so, what, what do you believe is the cause behind that for these ADEM people, especially because, um, you know, in my case, my fatigue after two years resolved. I, I haven't felt it since. And that's common with a lot of people I talk to with MOG and ADEM. Dr. Uh, Norbarsh? Sure. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, as opposed to multiple sclerosis, that uh, there have been many, many, many countless studies about characteristics of fatigue, the natural history of fatigue, uh, many clinical trials of uh, different interventions and medications for fatigue that has been done in multiple sclerosis. Uh, the amount of research that has been done in patients uh, with either ADEM or MOG uh, antibody associated diseases or NMO eh, are extremely small or non-existent. So actually I tried to look for a study uh, describing fatigue in MOG and I could not find any. Um, there are very few reports of uh, studies uh, on fatigue and ADEM particularly in children, because ADEM, as, as uh, you know, is a disease that is most common in children, uh, as well as uh, neuromyelitis optica. Uh, very, very few uh, papers uh, published in that regard. Uh, so um, this is, I'm hoping that uh, your advocacy would uh, stimulate and uh, uh, advocate for research, basically, in this uh, field for patients with MOG, uh, antibody disease, and ADEM. Um, what I can tell you, actually, uh, just uh, doing some research, um, I saw several articles regarding NMO and fatigue, and very interesting that uh, all of them reported that patients with neuromyelitis optica uh, reported fatigue at the same frequency as patients with MS. About 60, 70, 75 percent of patients with uh, NMO reported uh, fatigue, as compared to about 70 percent of patients with MS. So I think it's mostly a matter of not having data and uh, not having research in these uh, diseases, as opposed to uh, fatigue not being a problem. As you said, you you describe something that I have. Uh, not encountered, and it's very interesting, and I'm hoping that um, we will have more uh, research in this regard in patients, for example, with MOG and ADEM, uh, first about the frequency of fatigue and also the pattern of fatigue that might differ uh, from what we see in MS, which is usually a more chronic uh, problem, and as Dr. Pardo mentioned, usually associated with uh, lesions and damage to different parts of the brain uh, and the spinal cord. Um, so if I want to speculate, um, I would think that probably immunological mechanisms here are more in play. So uh, we know from other autoimmune diseases, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, it's a disease that we usually don't expect to, to have nerve damage or brain damage or spinal cord damage, uh, except very extremely rare cases. Uh, those patients also complain from fatigue very, very commonly, uh, similar to patients with Sjogren, 
this is another autoimmune disease, uh, rheumatological autoimmune disease, patients uh, complain from fatigue. Again, uh, probably uh, maybe different pattern as uh, what we see in MS. But again, um, just to summarize what I mentioned, unfortunately, we don't have much data and much uh, research for me to be able to, um, to comment on uh, fatigue in this very um, in this relatively rare neuroimmune disease. Got it. Thank you so much. I think that was a really a good overview and definitely points to, you know, as you said, the kind of, you know, lack of research specifically about this topic in these groups. So, you know, I, th I agree that that's incredibly important and kind of the, the next steps in all of this. Um, so I think, you know, we, we talked a, a lot about kind of the basis of fatigue in these conditions and and what the potential causes might be. Um, so if we can move on to, you know, how someone can treat uh, issues with fatigue in these conditions and you know what options are available I you know we talk about uh, medication options as well as you know the non kind of medication options um, so it's to start um, are there any you know medications or drugs out there that can alleviate fatigue uh, dr. Pardo uh, thank you for that question and uh, before going to uh, the issue of medications uh, uh, I, I I like to uh, um, uh, outline that when we identify fatigue and patients are complaining about about fatigue, the most important role for the clinician and healthcare provider is to identify the factors that are associated with that fatigue. So if we like to target uh, fatigue and treat fatigue, we need to determine first okay, what is the primary factor associated with fatigue? What is the underlying disease process? Is this disease process being controlled efficiently? We can talk about treatment of neuromyelitis optica or an isolated myelitis or optic neuritis or multiple sclerosis. But the other thing that actually is important is that the clinician need to identify if that disorder is affecting a specific pathway that are going to influence fatigue. And one of those pathways that is actually extremely important is the endocrine pathway. So our brain controls every function in our body. And one of those functions that are critical are the endocrinological functions. So in the brain, there are specific areas that determine what we call the neurological endocrine function. And that is going to influence the production of hormones, are going to produce the production of hormones that are very critical, not only for alertness, but also for physical and muscle activity. So any type of fatigue, actually the clinician needs to understand if that endocrine function is influenced by the neurological disease. Uh, let me give you an example. There are inflammatory diseases like neuromyelitis optica or MOG in which areas of the brain, particularly uh, an area of the brain that is called hypothalamus, that is the center master of endocrine function, may be affected. So in that type of situation, if a patient is complaining about fatigue and the healthcare provider identified that one area that is affected by the disease process is the neuroendocrine uh, uh, network, the healthcare provider needs to provide a very good assessment for that endocrine function and eventually replace hormones and replace things that uh, are deficient when the disease process is affected that network. The second part is that the clinician needs to identify the secondary factors that influence the development of fatigue. Let me give you an example. Uh, we mentioned before sleep disorders. If a sleep disorder is a major problem in a patient with neuromyelitis optica because in the middle of sleep at night, patients are experiencing a lot of cramps, a lot of spasticity, a lot of pain, and it's disrupting sleep, Obviously, that is an, that's a factor that needs to be corrected. So that's when we provide patients with a relaxing medications, like a medication that has a muscle relaxation to avoid too much cramping at night. So that is eventually going to help. 
patients to sleep better and eventually it's going to treat fatigue. The same situation happened with uh, other uh, abnormalities, let's say frequent urinary uh, activity and increase in urinary frequency and urinary urgency. If that happened at night, patients are waking up three, four times at night, and obviously that sleep disruption is going to be a factor next day for fatigue. So the clinician and the healthcare provider is obligated to control that bladder hyperactivity and in that way help the patient to avoid uh, uh, this sleep disruption by frequent uh, urination. So that is another level in which the healthcare provider may help to control fatigue. And there is a third level that is the identification of comorbidities. Let's say there are problems with depression, there are mood changes associated with the neuroinflammatory disorder. So that is obviously something that the uh, clinician need to intervene to modify uh, depression or to modify other type of uh, mood changes. And the same happened with other comorbidities. The, another example of that is uh, uh, physical deconditioning. There are patients that basically uh, 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 can modulate uh, fatigue just by improving physical stamina and physical conditioning. So those are the three different levels that a clinician and healthcare provider need to target before committing the patient to a specific treatment for fatigue itself. Uh, there are medications that are widely used for treatment of fatigue, like uh, uh, modafinil, that is also called Provigil, or amantadine, that is also called Symmetrel, or other medications like methylphenidate, uh, that is Ritalin, that are frequently prescribed for, treat for treatment of fatigue. But it is a major mistake that healthcare providers prescribe these medications without examining very carefully the factors that are influencing fatigue. I frequently emphasize to my patients I don't want to prescribe these medications until we are not sure that your sleep deprivation problem is improved or until your bladder dysfunction problem is not improved or until other issues related with pain at night or urination at night are improved. Because otherwise, it's going to be really not necessarily a good approach providing a lot of medications for uh, fatigue when other factors are basically ignored. So that is, I'm going to stop here because probably Dr. Bardia may, may have a lot of additions to my, my answer, but that is basically the approach that I think that we should follow as a healthcare provider in patients with neuroimmunological disorders complaining about fatigue. Well, thank you, Dr. Pardo. That's very informative. Um, I'd like to direct this question then to Dr. Norbach. Um, so are there any preventive measures that one can take to avoid the fatigue in the first place? Um, the easy answer, I would say, uh, there is nothing scientifically proven that prevents fatigue. But I want to uh, reiterate what Dr. Pardo mentioned, that uh, I also agree that the first step for treatment or prevention of fatigue should not be medications. Um, not only we need to uh, try to find other those secondary causes of fatigue, uh, like Dr. Pardo mentioned, bladder and sleep issues. Uh, we also to we also need to make sure that the patient is not deconditioned. So actually, one of the treatments of fatigue again, uh, I usually. Uh, uh, Get, give my examples from the field of multiple sclerosis because most of the research has been done in that field. Uh, one of the intervention that has been shown um, actually more conclusively than any other medication working for fatigue is uh, what is called graded exercise. So uh, you may think that this is a counterintuitive uh, recommendation. Patients who feel fatigue, particular physical fatigue, um, why they should do exercise and workout that may actually worsen their fatigue for the rest of the day. And that might be true to some extent, but if they do what 
has been studied and has been called graded exercise, meaning they start with very mild, very doable, uh, very short period of uh, any type of exercise. Would it be aerobic exercise or weightlifting or stretching or yoga or swimming? And over time, over weeks or months, uh, gradually increasing the intensity of the exercise. So if they could run for three minutes, after two weeks, increase it to five minutes, after another two weeks to seven minutes. So I'm just using that as an example. Or if they could uh, comfortably uh, lift um, two pounds, after a few weeks, increasing it to three, increasing it to five after a few weeks. And this graded exercise has been shown in randomized control trials, which are a gold standard for showing that something works, works in medicine to improve fatigue in MS. So uh, that has been studied as a treatment, but I assume that probably as a preventive measures um, that could work. If you increase your capacity of uh, doing more and more physical activity over time, um, that can have uh, therapeutic effects for sure. And as I said, uh, I can extend that probably to a, to a preventive measure um, for fatigue. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then uh, Dr. Pardo, uh, just a, a quick question about, you know, the, the fact that many of these relapsing disorders require preventive medicines like Celsept, uh, Rituxan, IVIG, or, you know, other medications that are used for acute attacks, um, like, you know, uh, steroids, IV steroids. What are the effects of these types of preventive medicines on fatigue? And then how, you know, how does someone manage their fatigue while taking them? Dr. Pardo. Uh, um it's a very interesting question, and probably I will start with the easy one, uh, and uh, and is the use of uh, IV steroids or even oral steroid treatment. Uh, the steroids actually uh, act act uh, hormones in our body, and uh, frequently patients uh, during uh, exacerbation of an immunological disorder are prescribed uh, with uh, uh, medications such as uh, uh, IV prednisolone, methylprednisolone, or, or oral prednisone. And the effect in the majority of patients is somewhat uh, uh, beneficial to control fatigue. And many patients actually uh, report very quickly this was the magic treatment for my fatigue. Uh, and it's a very uh, interesting phenomenology, and as I mentioned before, it's mostly because the steroid is, uh, has a hormonal effect on the body and activates many uh, uh, endocrine pathways and metabolic pathways, and patients feel uh, uh, a lot of energy. There is a small subset of patients that actually have the opposite. There is a small percentage of patients that don't react in that way with the IV steroid treatment. And again, go to be uh, uh, actually uh, in a more difficult situation and even experiencing uh, a lot of side effects. Uh, that effect, that is the hormonal effect of steroid treatment is transitory and is not sustainable. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons probably prolonged use of steroids. Uh, yeah, it's interesting and may provide some uh, a benefit for fatigue, but it's not a sustainable therapy because it produces a lot of comorbidities and a lot of side effects. Now, the, the second part of the equation is uh, is more difficult. Uh, what happened with B-cell therapies like rituximab or mycophenolate and the effect on fatigue? I don't believe that there is an answer for that, and I believe that those are mostly long-term effects that uh, I, 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 I'm not sure, I, I don't believe that there is a, a, a good study that demonstrates if those uh, treatments are affecting uh, uh, fatigue. Uh, eventually, theoretically, we can say that may affect fatigue if they are controlling the primary disease process and reducing the amount of neuroinflammation in the brain, and eventually in that way may help to control fatigue. But I don't believe that there is a clear, clear understanding of the role of those medications. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pardo. Um, I'm going to direct this at Dr. Norbach. Um, 
you know, in general, when should a patient start feeling concerned about their fatigue level? And, and when do you think they should reach out to their doctor? So I don't think there is any specific time uh, or guidelines for that. Uh, when the patient, when a patient uh, sees his or, or her doctor or neurologist, it's always good to talk about uh, the chronic symptoms that they have, um, including fatigue, including uh, depression, including cognitive problems. Um, also, I think it's a duty of the physician to regularly uh, inquire about these symptoms. So we, of course, ask about symptoms suggestive for a relapse, uh, symptoms suggestive for the disease progression. Uh, we also routinely and regularly ask about these chronic and invisible symptoms. And uh, if it's not the physician asking the patient, I think the patient should uh, volunteer this information. And uh, many of my patients, they do. Even before I ask them, I just uh, ask an open-ended question how, how they are doing, and uh, they mention they mention this problem of fatigue. If they don't, I usually try to specifically ask about uh, fatigue, uh, their energy level, um, and uh, change, changes between, uh, for example, this visit and the previous visit, if there has been uh, differences. Um, so, um, I think any time and any visit uh, would be a good time if a patient is concerned that uh, their fatigue is out of the proportion of what they do. So that's 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 important to realize that um, many healthy people also get fatigued, but uh, the fatigue that is abnormal and pathological in these neuroimmune disorders is the type of fatigue that's out of the proportion of what the patient does and is also affecting uh, their life. Uh, so when that happens, and uh, if the patient thinks that's uh, the 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 low energy they feel, both mentally and physically, is out of the proportion of what they do, and out of the proportion of other people uh, at home or at work uh, who do not have that neuroimmune disorder, and it's really affecting their lives, uh, they should bring it up uh, with their um, healthcare provider. Thank you. Um, well, that's certainly interesting. I mean, I, I certainly had that experience, and um, you know, I, I had debilitating fatigue. And and it, when I got to the doctor, I really found that it was it was very difficult for them. Uh, I don't think that they really knew my fatigue level um, as they saw me sitting there. So I, I just wondered if there's any real way to act accurately measure those fatigue levels while you're visiting your doctor and talking about this with them. Sure. So there is, uh, as we talked uh, earlier, fatigue is a subjective feeling. So there is no marker on the blood work or on the MRI or any other specific test uh, that we can do to objectively uh, measure fatigue at this point. Uh, but there are many uh, standardized questionnaires uh, that uh, have been developed to measure fatigue both in the clinical setting, for example, when uh, a patient goes to the doctor and during the, the clinic visit, um, the, those uh, questionnaires and surveys can be used. And also uh, in research, for example, to, to assess the, the effect of a medication or an intervention on fatigue, we use these uh, questionnaires that have been validated in many different diseases, some of them more specifically for MS, uh, some for different neurological diseases. Um, so uh, in the absence of an objective biomarker, uh, we use these uh, patient-reported uh, surveys and questionnaires uh, in the clinic and uh, in research. Great, thank you. Um, and then, so, you know, if... if Chronic fatigue, you know, is a real symptom of these diseases, and you know, neurologists recognize this. Um, and someone's, you know, work or school life is significantly impacted by this symptom of the condition. Um, how can someone, you know, go about getting the appropriate accommodations, either through disability or something like an IEP in a school? Um, you know, how can the, their neurologist kind of be involved in in getting those necessary accommodations? Uh, so. Um... 
as long as uh, the neurologist, the physician realize that this is a real problem and this is a common problem and this is a disabling problem, uh, there should be no problem with uh, providing documentation that uh, this patient has this specific neuroimmune disease and is suffering from uh, uh, disabling fatigue that may interfere with uh, their job or with their school performance and they require uh, adequate accommodation. So I have had um, several patients uh, who requested letters uh, stating this issue and uh, I've provided them with the letters and usually um, their employers or their schools uh, have been really accommodating uh, with this issue. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had um, any major issue with uh, uh, with the employers or with the schools understanding and appreciating uh, and doing the necessary uh, accommodations for for patients. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, I, we have a question here from uh, our community, and basically, right that um, you know, fatigue for them can continues to be a difficult si symptom to manage because they have MS. Um, she she says uh, she swims, or he or she says they swim five times a week, eat healthy, and plenty of rest. However, fatigue never ceases. Um, can you please share any new research, trials, et cetera, that shows some promise for treating fatigue uh, outside um, modafinil? Sure. So uh, starting from non-medication uh, interventions, again, aside from that graded exercise that I mentioned, and it seems that this patient is actually following that uh, recommendation of trying to stay fit and active, uh, uh, a non-medical, non-medication intervention that again has been in multiple clinical trials uh, shown to be effective for reducing fatigue uh, is what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. So, uh, you know, uh, patients who have had mood issues and depression issues might be uh, familiar with this intervention. It's an intervention that is proven to be effective uh, for alleviating depression as good and as efficacious as medications, for example, SSRIs, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that is administered by a licensed uh, therapist uh, is quite effective for depression. It's also been shown to be effective in management of, of fatigue. Uh, again, what I'm talking about is uh, specific to MS, but I assume that it may apply to other neuroimmune diseases. The problem is, Many patients may not have access to uh, therapists and psychotherapists who, uh, who are specialized in doing cognitive behavioral therapy. Talking about medications, Dr. Pardo mentioned the list of medications that we commonly use for treatment of fatigue, including amantadine, including modafinil, including psychostimulants such as Ritalin, uh, Vyvanse, Adderall. Uh, the problem with them is, unfortunately, we really don't know if they work. Uh, there have been several studies done in MS with conflicting results, and actually for uh, psychostimulants, for uh, for example, uh, Adderall, Ritalin, Vyvanse, there has been no study in, in neuroimmune conditions, actually. But uh, we commonly use them and prescribe them. Uh, uh, my colleague and I uh, recently finished a, a large uh, randomized controlled trials of actually testing all these uh, three groups of medication, amantadine, modafinil or provigil, and methylphenidate or ritalin. Uh, in patients with MS fatigue, we, uh, the study was completed about uh, 10 days ago, and uh, we are going to start analyzing the results to find out if any one of these medications is going to be better than placebo in improving fatigue. So the result of this study can inform us uh, if the use of these medications that we commonly use, and of course they can be associated with side effects, is justified in improving fatigue. Um, hopefully we will know more, we will know the results in a month or two, uh, and uh, I believe that's gonna be helpful. I also uh, work on some novel treatments, uh, 
for example, you may have heard about a medication called ketamine, which is an old anesthetic and actually a medication that used to be uh, a medication, a drug of abuse. But in the past 10 or 15 years, it was shown that it's extremely effective in uh, improving depression, even in patients who do not respond to other medications. Uh, there, there were some studies that suggest that it may be also uh, uh, good and efficacious for fatigue in other conditions, not in neuroimmune conditions. And we recently uh, performed a small, what we call pilot study, basically in very few patients. Uh, we did a randomized control trial and uh, the results were promising that uh, even one infusion of ketamine seemed to uh, improve fatigue uh, based on uh, one or two questionnaires that we did. And based on the other questionnaire, it did not. So the results are not completely clear, but the results were promising. And uh, hopefully we will do a larger study to, to find out if really giving ketamine to patients that uh, actually it was recently approved, a nasal formulation of ketamine was approved for uh, for depression to see if it also has beneficial effects uh, in fatigue. Wow, yeah, no, that's that's very exciting. You know, I've heard of, of ketamine in, in depression, so it's you know it's interesting to hear you know these uh, you know uh, research findings as well. So thank you. Um, and as we clo close up, I just wanted to ask if there was anything else you wanted to mention that we didn't cover um, today that you think you know would be important to to mention. Um, I think you covered um, most of the topics that uh, we wanted to talk about. Uh, maybe I reiterate the importance of research. So fatigue is a, a multifactorial uh, condition and symptom in MS and other neuroimmune conditions. And uh, the amount of knowledge is really poor. And as you can tell, uh, the, the availability of treatment is minimal and poor. Uh, so we really, really need more research to find out what, uh, what are the contributing factors to the development of fatigue in MS and other neuroimmune conditions, and uh, also more research into uh, novel treatments for this extremely common and very disabling uh, symptom. Um, not only we talked about this being a common condition in MS, it's also present, common, and disabling in other neuroimmune disorders. However, uh, our understanding, our knowledge about uh, fatigue in other neuroimmune disorders, including MOG, ADEM, myelitis, uh, neuromyelitis optica, is extremely low. So uh, it's important patients uh, and family members and people who are uh, affected by these disorders to advocate for not only, of course, finding immunotherapies to control relapses and uh, prevent relapses, also uh, we need to do more research for this, again, invisible symptoms that are extremely common and disabling. Uh, hopefully we will have more data and more solutions uh, for, for fatigue in the future. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. We you know got through as many questions as we could, but you know hope to continue the conversation in the future. So, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for having me. All right. Bye. Bye.